I am ready right here to power rank every program in the SEC, not historically. When I talk about power ranking programs, here is what I mean. My criteria is I look at a three-year rolling snapshot of your on-field performance, of your talent acquisition, of your stability, and your resource pool. How good are your facilities? How deep are your pockets? How able are you to compete at the highest levels to hire? Those are the things I care about, not over the past 20 years, over the past three years. That's how I define this. Those are my critical metrics. We have 16 teams in this conference right now. I figure we start in tier one. Georgia's the top program in the SEC right now. Pretty easy. Over the past three years, they have won a couple of national championships. They've only lost two games, I think, and they've both been to Alabama. They are very stable. They have at the moment, who I would rank as the number one overall head coach in the SEC, and who knows, maybe even college football with Kirby Smart. Just a machine, just a freight train with every car either painted red or black, all moving in the same direction. I mean, they just lost Claude Felton, and they still may not skip a beat. And Claude's a legend. Enjoy retirement, by the way, Claude. Forgot to mention that the other day. A guy who has done a lot to help this show out, I can promise you. Number two program, in the SEC is Alabama. And coaching change matters here because had Bama not lost Nick Saban, Alabama probably is still the number one program because they've, they've beaten Georgia the last couple of times. They've, well, two, two of the last times they played. Um, they've got double-digit wins every year. Kalen DeBoer is a phenomenal coach. I've got him as a top five head coach in the country. So it's not like Alabama massively downgraded. You lose a legend, but In the here and now, the day-to-day, the month-to-month, the year-to-year, you replace him with a really high-caliber head coach in his own right, and Kalen DeBoer just put together a really good staff. They've been the number 1A recruiter along with Georgia in this conference over the last several years, and there's never a question of commitment. There's never a question of resource here. They're all in. So this is pretty simple. Georgia, Alabama, and you can put them in any order you want to. I, I mean, I was pretty solidly Georgia 1, Alabama 2, given the coaching turnover. But that's Tier 1. Now, I could go to Tier 2 right now, but that would be too simple. So what I want to do is go to Tier 5. We ended up having five tiers of programs in the SEC. I want to go to number 14 right quick. Let's get the bottom taken care of. Arkansas, number 14 program in the SEC right now. There's clear regression with this program. They've gone 9 and 4, 7 and 6, 4 and 8 the last 3 years on field. You've had a ton of staff turnover. They've done pretty decently recruiting, but there's big question regarding the overall stability. Mississippi State is number 15, and that's much more just a victim of circumstance with what happened with Mike Leach, and they've had 3 head coaches now in 3 years. Jeff Levy as a head coach, we don't know anything about him because this will be his first shot as a head coach. Um, They've been fairly good at acquiring talent, but until there's less unknown, we got to put Mississippi State there. And Vanderbilt, we put in their own tier. We called it Tier V. We're not going to bang on Vanderbilt right down the road from us. Good people over there. But Vanderbilt, of course, is going to be number 16 in the SEC. Now, I want to go to Tier 4. Let's work our way up a little bit. The number 11 program in the SEC right now. I've got South Carolina. Last three years, seven and six, eight and five, five and seven. They play brutal schedules every year. So the caliber of ball they're playing would be, you know, much more comparable to like eight wins, nine wins in some other conferences. But we're talking about the SEC here. Uh, They have had top 25 recruiting and good portal. There's good energy about the program. And so I'm putting them at number 11 I look at Kentucky at number 12. We struggled with this. We really struggled with the order of South Carolina and Kentucky. You could easily sell me on 11 and 12 flip-flopping. Kentucky's got a 10-win season and a couple of 7-win seasons in the last three years. So their on-field has been better than South Carolina. They've gone 1 and 2 against South Carolina, though. They've got really good portal strategy. Kentucky has not recruited right on par with South Carolina, although it hasn't been far off. Uh, But they've got really good portal strategy, and they know exactly what they have to do. They know exactly who they need. Mark Stoops, he's been stable. They've had churn elsewhere. I mean, Liam Cohen's been in and out the door five times in the last three years, it feels like, at offensive coordinator. 
But South Carolina, Kentucky, 11, 12. Florida's all the way down at 13. And I want you to think about this. One of the four bullet points that I care about a lot is resource pool. And Florida's got a much better resource pool than any of the other programs that are floating around down here, which just shows you how poor they've been on the field. They have had three straight sub-500 seasons, but they've also had three top-20 recruiting classes. So they're acquiring talent. They got good resource pool. Like, there's good tradition. The, the program, that brand is iconic, but they're not winning. So how in the world could you bump them up? They haven't even been above 500. Not for one year, but for three years right now. Uh, 2024, obviously, brutal schedule, make or break year in many cases for Billy Napier and his staff. And I would also say, before we go to the next tier, I would also say, look at number 11 all the way down through 16. I would say it would be a very, very big surprise, even in a 12-team playoff era, if any of those teams made the playoff this next year. Every other team from 10 on up, you could paint me a picture where I could see them making the playoff this year. So let's go to Tier 2. Tier 2, or Tier 3, I guess it would be. Texas A&M, we put it 8. Staff moves have happened here, but I think they equal a net upgrade. So normally, if you lose your head coach, it's dragging you down. I actually think it kind of inflates them a little bit. They've gone 8-4, 5-7, and 7-6 four, and seven, seven and on the field, but the recruiting and the pool are both top-notch. Resources like you wouldn't believe. Recruiting's been good. They have been excellent in the portal in Mike Elko's short time there. I got a top-five portal class right now. So Texas A&M at eight. Auburn is at nine. Huge wild card. Probably the biggest wild card team in the conference this year. Hugh Freeze has proven as a program builder and as a head coach I don't doubt him. It's not like Jeff Levy taking over where he's never been a head coach before. But also, I will admit, uh, there is a lot of leaning towards the latter year here. So last year, you know, on the field, they showed, I thought, reasons to be optimistic about the future, but also they just signed the number eight recruiting class in the country. And so they're going to be extremely aggressive in the portal as well. I don't think they're done in this cycle, for example. You got a whole lot of stuff about to happen all over the country. So give me Auburn at number nine. Give me Missouri at number 10. Double-digit wins last year. How much do we make of that? Because they were not that the two years before that. They just extended Eli Drinkwitz, good stability in the program. It feels like 2024 is key here. If 2024 were another 10-win season, I could see Missouri jumping up in like the top seven here. They also have been very good in the portal. And their, their recruiting's not bad either. So Missouri is a very solid 10. If Missouri is the 10th best program in your conference, and you could probably argue me up past 10, you got a really deep conference. Now let's go to tier two. Yeah, that finally, finally we get up to tier two. This is loaded. This is tough. So we got Texas as the number three program in the SEC. They border on one, tier one. In fact, I guarantee you there are a lot of people who say Texas should be a tier one program. No, they shouldn't. Not right now, they shouldn't. They should be a high tier two program. And the reasons are right there on the bottom of your screen. On field production matters a lot here. And unlike Georgia and Alabama, Texas has lost too many games to inexcusable opponents to merit being a number one program, a tier one program right now. I mean, they've lost to Texas Tech, Oklahoma State, TCU, Washington twice, Arkansas, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Baylor, or Kansas and Baylor in the last three years. Georgia and Alabama hadn't done that. Texas is not on their level as a program yet. Now, if you wanted to argue from this point moving forward, they will be. That's cool. That's not how I look at it, though. So if you want to do that, that's doing it your way. We're doing it my way here. And therefore, Texas is still really lofty. They're up at number three and a lot of indicators pointing in the right direction. That's why they're number three. Just went to the playoff last year, too. LSU at number four. You got the last year of Ed Orgeron still baked in here. But this is Brian Kelly's program now. It's a top talent acquisition program, one of the top head coaches in the country leading the program, back-to-back double-digit win seasons. And so even though I said the last year of Orgeron is baked in, it's really, really on the back burner when I say baked in uh, because there is hardly anything that is lingering there about what LSU was under Orgeron in the latter stages. So LSU rock solid, LSU trending in the right direction, strong number four there. And you could argue me... 
I mean, I would argue back, but you could argue with me they should be number three. I'd put Texas above them. I've got Oklahoma at number five. Oklahoma double-digit wins two of the last three years. You've got that sub-500 year baked in there. But Brent Venables has taken over. He's had three top ten recruiting and portal classes combined. They've got good stability. Brent Venables, you could argue, still has somewhat of a question mark on him. I think a lot of that's getting answered, though. Uh, This year, much like I said with Missouri, if OU rattles off nine or ten wins, then they're, they're back to being Oklahoma. Um, offensive line's a question. Got Jackson Arnold starting a quarterback this year. But Oklahoma, rock-solid program. They're there at number five. There was late change in the power rankings here in six and seven. Because we had Tennessee above Ole Miss most of the afternoon. But then the more we looked at it, the more we said, hold on. Ole Miss has gone 10 and three, eight and five, 11 and two. There's a head-to-head win against Tennessee baked in there. Golf balls involved and everything. W- why would we not put Ole Miss ahead of Tennessee? Well, we are. Uh, they're going about acquiring talent a little different way, but they're, they're doing it a way that you're allowed to do it with the portal. And Lane Kiffin, I can't believe this. I think a lot of you find it hard to believe, has created a very, very stable organization over there. And uh, the folks who doubted him before probably still doubt him. And the folks who defended him before still defend him. He's winning football games. I don't know what more to tell you. He's winning football games over there. So uh, we got Ole Miss number six. Got Tennessee number seven. Splitting hairs here. You could easily put Tennessee at six. 20 wins in the last two seasons. Uh, They've beaten Alabama. Josh Heupel is a top 15 recruiter, and they've got deep pockets there. The resource pool is not in doubt. Uh, They've got a chancellor who will go to bat for them. They've got an AD who will go to bat for them. So there you see it. The SEC power rankings heading into this year has nothing to do with 2024. It has nothing to do with what I think you will become. That is a three-year rolling snapshot of on-field production, talent acquisition, sort of the, the resources you have, and stability. That's how I define the difference between a program and a team. I'm sure there'll be nothing but agreements in the comments.